Uh, today we have uh, Omar uh, from the Miller Lab who's going to be talking about neural decoding of spike trains and local field potentials with machine learning in Python. Uh, hello guys, thank you, Ellie. Do I need to speak here or just with my, uh, my yeah, you're good. All right, so um, thank you all for coming. Uh, so today I'm going to present to you some tutorial on neural decoding. Uh, we're going to do that with the spikes uh, and LFPs. So we're going to be using uh, Python and, and also uh, machine learning. Um, so let's get uh, started first. So first I'm going to give you some introduction on neural decoding, what neural decoding is, and also some background. And then we're going to jump in into a uh, Python tutorial with LFPs and spikes. And then uh, if we have time, we are going to play with the notebooks and change some parameters and change the data, change the model, and then uh, see what happens. We might even break the code, but it's okay. Uh, can you guys raise your hand if you have experience with Python? You have experience with scikit-learn? Who's doing only MATLAB? MATLAB. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so we have a majority of Python, but there is a couple also doing uh, MATLAB. So uh, it's very, uh, Python is actually very similar to MATLAB, but uh, if you don't understand some of the commands we're going to present, don't be shy and ask questions. Anything is valid, so this tutorial is for everybody. So if you have any questions, don't feel that you don't know the background or anything, I'll be happy to explain for you. And if we run over time, we'll just explain as far as we can get. So just an introduction on spikes and local few potentials. So <clears throat> the example that you can see here is that we are recording from a certain area of the brain, and then we extract uh, a wideband signal and then this signal can be a uh, filter, high pass filter to obtain uh, spike signals. And then if we low pass filter, we can obtain the local field potentials, right? So this recording is very special because uh, we can listen to the neurons that are nearby the uh, probe that we are inserting in the brain. And then based on that, we can uh, discriminate uh, the spikes by the way of the waveforms and also by the, um, by the way we set this treasure here. And then we have also the local uh, lo low-pass filter that can help us to obtain the uh, summit electric current flowing from multiple nearby neurons. So the local field potential is more like a summation of the of what's going on around this probe here, while the spikes are used like single neurons that we can isolate based on this wideband. So who's who's working with the spikes or LFB here? Okay, that's great. <laughs> yeah, great to hear, guys. So you're gonna learn a lot today. So <clears throat> this is usually how sp spikes look like. So we have here a spike train uh, going over time. So just here you can see we're listening to some um, neuron in the brain. And then uh, the way we can process these spikes is to obtain some fire rate here. And we obtain that by binding over time. So what we do is we take some bind window and then we go over time and then we count the spikes in a certain period, right? So it's basically like doing a histogram, histogram here. So, but sometimes we want a continuous signal. So something that we can do is to approximate the firing rate by using a Gaussian window, for example, for 50 milliseconds. So first we get this, uh, the binding time, and then from here we can pass to the firing rate uh, like this, right? So this is a more like a continuous signal and will be useful for uh, certain types of processing that we can do with the signal. And that's actually the signal that we're going to use today for this tutorial. So here is an example of uh, the spike rate that we're going to analyze today. So each color here represents one area of the brain. So we have PFC and B4. And you can see here that in some cases, the spike rate is very high and for other cases, it's very low, depending on how the neuron is reacting to certain stimulus. Right, so that's the example of the signal. And here we have another example, for, but now for the LFP, right? So you can see here, is, it almost looks like noise here, right? But there's actually uh, some frequency components going on here that my lab usually analyze to try to infer what's going on in the brain. And also there's two areas, which is PFC and B4. So explain a little bit of what neural decoding is. Um, 
we do near all the coding in our brains. It's not only that animals or um, other types of, 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 of special types of um, species do it. So every single um, uh, brain that exists today does some kind of encoding. So we have here, for example, this image. Uh, this is very famous in computer science, is the LENA image. And then we encode it in, with, um, in our brains with a certain pattern of activity with neurons over time. And then we have different conditions, and then we obtain different patterns, right? So this happens automatically in our brain, right? So it goes the image from here, and then our brain expresses this image like that. So our job as a neuroscientist, is also as, a, as an engineer, we is, uh, our job is to uh, go from here and try to go back here by somehow trying to predict what happened from just reading the stimulus here, from the neural activity. So being a little bit more specific, so here we have the type of uh, stimulus that we're going to analyze today. So it's uh, color or motion of, um, of, of, a, of a stimulus here. And then we have arrows that represent also how these kind of patterns are moving in a screen when a monkey is watching this, right? So during this tutorial, we are going to analyze this type of stimulus. And then uh, going from here, we will try to go back and see how much of this we can decode based on, uh, on the activity in the brain. So uh, expanding the analysis and expanding what I've been saying about uh, decoding. So for example, um, Suppose that those are two neurons of um, the primate brain in a certain area, and then we show a spider, right? And we can see here that um, we have certain selectivity of neuron two for the spider, so we can see that there's activity here. And then when the leading tower of Pisa is shown, we can see here that uh, neuron one is more selective to this one, right? So there is like a certain pattern going on here, right? And our job is to say, uh, in which cases uh, and in which time this happens. Right, so something that we can do is just to plot the firing of the neuron one by the firing of the neuron two, and then try to uh, come up with a dimensionality reduction of, of what's happening here, right? So this is a very easy way to do that. And then we can express the trials this way. So each dot here is a trial, and then it's represented in a, in a two dimensional space. So then we can use a machine learning model that can uh, process this data and then come up with some uh, classifier that can actually identify these two types of activities. And then we can say with certain um, accuracy how, how well we're doing to classify these two types of patterns when they're happening in the brain. So also I want to say why um, neural decoding is important. So, so we have... Um, in neuroscience, like the first types of analysis that were made were like single neuron analysis, right? So my lab, so Professor Miller, he, he built his career, his career with uh, single neuron analysis. And so that's, you know, a few decades from now. And now we are evolving to systems that can actually record many, many neurons at the same time with a high level of accuracy, right? So for example, what I'm showing here is the neuro, neuro pixels. So it's a, a special type of probe that um, can acquire very many um, neuron recordings at the, at the same time. So for example, we have here 741 neurons that were acquired at the same time for the mouse brain. So here we have uh, the visual cortex, uh, the hippocampus, and the thalamus. So look at how, how many neurons we can acquire today, right? And then, so how are we going to be able to make sense of this data, right? So we have all this huge data, and the more, the larger it is, the harder it gets to analyze, right? But um, so we have an advantage, uh, advantage today, which is that we also have some advance in computing systems. So computing systems are getting fa faster and faster, and they are also coming up with new ways of analyzing this data, uh, thanks to open libraries like Python. <clears throat> so what's the pipeline of uh, the coding analysis? So first of all, we have the, the data. So I have explained before. So here we have the LFPs and the spikes. And then we need to do some type of pre-processing with the data. So we can do dimensionality reduction, or we can average the signal, or we can also do sampling the signal. So actually, the, the data that we're going to use today, yeah, 
So the data we're going to use today is, has been those samples, so you can actually play with it and it's easier to process and you will be able to run it in your computer. So that's some type of pre-processing that I have already done for you, but you also will need to do it for your uh, data sets. Uh, we are not going to go over that step today because we have limited time, but feel free to reach out with me and I also explain you how to do it. But this is one of the stages that we, can, we have to do for uh, neural decoding. Then we need to go to model selection. So we can choose from linear, nonlinear models or ensemble models. And we're going to go in, in some detail with some of these models. And then we can go to model vali validation and evaluation, right? So we have our model, we have the data, we have done some processing, and now I want to obtain some accuracy scores or, or how well I'm doing to, to predict certain behavior uh, of some data that, that I have, right? Can be spikes or LFPs, which is gonna be the the, the focus for today. So explaining a little bit more on the model selection. So I'm going to go over a little bit on how that's done. So imagine that we have a fish cat data set. All right, so uh, what has happened here is that a monkey was shown with a picture of a fish or a picture of a cat, right? And then we were able to record uh, five neurons responses, as you can see here. I don't know if you can read it, but this is neural uh, population responses. And so we have here from N1 to N5, right? And then uh, the, the shade of the color here, it says how, how much activation I have for a certain neuron, right? And then my data set goes from here all the way to here, right? So I'm having either a fish or a cat on the way down here, right? So then my job is to, okay, so if I want to predict a certain variable, if I want to, to say, uh, if I want to build a model that says that it's a cat or a fish, I have to divide my data set into training and testing, right? To, to, to train my model and then test if my hypothesis is correct, what I was assuming. And then I need to select this model here, and then I have to pass the training labels, and the training data to this untrained classifier, but I have to select it from the family of linear, nonlinear, on ensemble learning. And then I have a training classifier at the end, right? So once I have this guy here, then we can pick up on the test set. So here is again our train classifier, right? And then the test data goes here, and then the test labels goes out here because it's after the prediction is made. So I'm waiting for the prediction to be made. And then I have the ground truth here, and then the predicted labels, and then I can, I can make some statistics on, on how well it's doing. So in this tutorial, we are going to go over all this process, but in a, in a better way. And how is that better way? is that we are going to do cross-validation. So how does cross-validation works? Is instead of having just uh, training and testing data, I have several folds where I can test, try and test my assumptions, right? So going, going the same with the cat and fish um, data set, here I can separate by folds, right? So I have one fold, two folds, three folds. So I can pick up neuron data from anywhere here, right? And I can build my splits here. Then once I have them, I select two of them for training, one of them for testing. Two, two of them for training and testing. So I do the same for the three folds. And then at the end of the day, I'm going to do, um, I'm going to get three accuracy scores of the three folds. And then what I can do is uh, averaging the runs and then I can obtain an average score of the representation here. One of the problems with this kind of approach compared to what I sh showed before is that here we need to train three models instead of just one, right? So it's more computationally intensive rather than just training one model. So that's one of the disadvantages, but this one offers more, um, um, the, the classification accuracy that we get is, is less biased than just training and testing with one classifier. Um, so, so now we jump into the data set. Any questions so far? Uh, I see that you're, you're splitting the data set completely into multiple cross validated sets. Yes. Is there <coughs> any advantage to that over, for example, random selection multiple times, even though there may be uh, overlap? Yeah, so no, we don't do any kind of overlap. So we separate the, the, the folds, and the data never sees each other because we, we want to uh, create them so independent from them that the accuracy that we get is actually independent, and then we can compare the overall accuracy. There. 
All right, guys, so now we are going to go into the data set that we're going to be uh, using today and playing with it today. So here is the task. So it's a motion and color categorization data set. So basically what the monkey has to do is to choose that, uh, classify their motion or color when a stimulus is shown, right? So this is the experimental execution. So we're going to go over this from the entire um, uh, the notebook that I have for this tutorial. So if you, you really need to understand this. So first, um, the fixation goes from like 0.5 seconds, right? So the monkey just needs to fixate at the center of the screen. And then a queue is shown after this fixation. And then the queue uh, gives some indication that the monkey has to categorize either motion or color here, right? And then once the monkey makes the decision, after the queue is shown, the stimulus is shown, it has three seconds to make a decision of if either it was um, a motion or color uh, sample. Right, so that's the entire experiment. I'm going a little bit more into detail on what's going on in the experiment. So after the fixation is, um, has happened, the queue is shown, right? But there are four types of cues. There are two for motion and two for color. So when either of the two of those are shown, like the monkey already knows that it's gonna be a motion uh, trial, right? And a color trial. So depending on, on, on the color, on the configuration here of the color and the motion, then the monkey has to decide either to look left or look right. right? So to understand this a little bit more clearly, here we have uh, the response. So when, when a motion, uh, so suppose that a motion Q was shown, right? Suppose that this X was shown, right? So and suppose that this, this pattern of the arrow up is shown here. So then the monkey has to categorize this as left, right? Because it's, it's right here. And then go back here, and then if you look at the, at the up arrow here, it, it says left when it's a motion trial, right? So it's the same depending on the side of the screen here. So it's gonna be left or right depending on the configurations here. But the stimulus here is always shown at the center. So this is not actually, this is only for you to guide you what's gonna happen with the response, but the type of, of arrows and the type of color is always shown here at the center of the screen. Uh, any questions so far? Because we're going to go here in there. So yeah. uh, what is the point of using two different kinds of raw cues for the same role? Uh, to disassociate the, uh, the stimulus. I mean, yeah. uh, you have like a cross and a star shape for the motion. Yeah. What was the point of using two for one kind of rule? Uh, well, the reason is that it's less probable that the monkey is going to uh, to infer that from just one and one cue. So we have more uh, types of cues that we can show to the monkey, right? So it's four instead of just two, right? So the monkey has to has a harder time to memorize the patterns, right? So it's it's more clear when. Uh, we have two cues because the, the monkey has to make a better effort to learn that it's either a motion or a categorization term. All right, anything else, guys? Yeah. Uh, so in this kind of cue, what's the interpretation? Like if the mouse, uh, sorry, if the monkey does the wrong, uh, like a wrong choice, it, yeah. it, is it because it's, it's just like, um, like uh, uh, took one cue wrong or is it because the that the monkey like took both cues and then couldn't decide like which say if the monkey thinks so both the motion and color are important but then I don't know like uh, like like which way I should go. Yeah so for example so the cue is always shown right? Yeah. So it, there's always one cue shown in any trial right? And then uh, if we combine this with the, pa the pattern that is shown, right? So this, we have this plus the pattern. Then the monkey has to decide either to look left or look right, right? And if the monkey doesn't do it right, as the pattern is shown here, then that's an incorrect trial. We label it as, as incorrect because it's not doing as, as it was trained to be. So this is after a train has been performed in the monkey. So. Andrew, how, how long does it take to train these monkeys? Like two years. Yeah. So it takes two, year, two years for them 
to learn this kind of rules. So it's hard. It's hard for them, and uh, yeah, it's a lot of effort that hard they have to. to Huh? <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard for the postdoc to <laughs> train the monkey. Okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so this is the way the, uh, the experiment works. But we're going to focus entirely on categorizing, uh, on decoding the motion or the color stimulus based on, on the correct trails. So we, we are going to eliminate the ground trails here. Just to answer your question, the, the goal of the Miller Lab is to talk about task switching. That's why they have these really more complicated like set of cues. Right. So it's not just like picking up a cue and doing a decision. They want to see if they can like mix and match a few different types of sensory inputs and come up with a decision. So they have to midway during the task switch from one decision to another. Or so. so that's why they have this uh, kind of a more complicated setup. So. Yeah, that's true, that's true, yeah. So we like to uh, perform very complex experiments, which at the end of the day is harder for us to do it, but you know, it pays off at the end if we can get this kind of papers published. But um, yeah, anyway, so moving on a little bit. So if you remember, I showed you this image at the beginning, right? Showing you like these are the spike rates and things like that. But now we can understand what's going on over time, right? So now we have labels of what's happening in time. So first we have uh, the fixation. This is in milliseconds here. So you have fixation from 0 to 500 milliseconds. Then from 500 milliseconds to 1,500 uh, is the Q, the, the Q is shown. And then the stimulus is shown after here, right? So after the stimulus is fired up here, bam, the monkey has uh, three seconds to respond, but usually responds very quickly. So just like. 200 uh, milliseconds after that. So these are the brain regions that, are, uh, that were recorded for the task that I just showed. And um, we're going to focus on PFC and B4, right? So this is probably one of the biggest uh, data sets that my lab has. Um, we are generating more at the moment, but that we have finished recording, this is probably one of the biggest because it has several areas of the brain. And I'm doing uh, some research with this uh, data set right now, and I'm very soon to publish something about it. But uh, for the case of the tutorial here, we're just going to focus on two areas. So we can have time to discuss what's going on, and for you to also to run the experiments in your laptops if you want to do it. So what are the objectives of this tutorial? So. As I have explained to you, we're going to do a spikes and LFPs decoding, and we're going to focus on two areas, P4 and PFC. And we're going to do that in a single experimental session. So it's a very small data set compared to the 44 that are total for, for all the, the data that we have for this, this task. And then we're going to perform cross-validation, and then we're going to evaluate how, how good we're doing with the cross-validation with uh, a metrical F-score. If you want to know more, uh, this is this F score is a combination of the precision and recall. It's uh, an harmonic mean, and if you want to find out more, I have all these uh, links so you can check out. And we're gonna share with you the slides and the code so you can do this at home as well. So, as the title of my talk suggested, I wanted to focus on Python, and I re I, I really want to justify why I think Python is the best language to do this kind of analysis. So here we have um, the different type of packages that we have in Python, right? So something uh, very important to, to acknowledge is that all these packages are being developed by people like me or somebody that is not being directly paid to develop these uh, packages, right? So we have here something like AstroPy, or SumPy, or this is for astronomy recording, and this is for physics. So all these packages, scikit-learn, that we're going to jump in in a, in a second, all these are very open source, so you can go and see what's going on in the package, right? So you can just look at the source code and everything is open. But there is a very uh, lively uh, environment there of people that is developing all these tools. and They're always um, looking forward in a, in a way to improve the analysis of anything, right? So for example, AstroPy is very active, so they have a lot of versions going on, like going forward in terms of how to process in parallel if they want to use GPUs, there is people working on different aspects, right? 
And I think that this is the best way you can construct an uh, environment for an, uh, data analysis compared to other packages like, like R or MATLAB that also have like open source um, packages, but it's more limited the, the type of operations that you can, you can do or, or the type of s s scope of the language that, that, that it offers, for example, for, for Python that has a lot of flexibility on the things that you can do. For example, here for the tutorial that we're going to do today, we're going to focus on those um, libraries. So it's matplotlib is for plotting, pandas for pro processing, scipy for processing as well. We have scikit-learn, Jupyter, and you can see that just for this tutorial, we're using all these uh, libraries, right? So we're making use of the ecosystem just by doing all research and by doing near all the coding. So I also wanted to jump in a little bit before running the code, I wanted to explain uh, to you some of the basics of the machine learning model in, in case that you don't have much experience about it. So for this tutorial, we're going to focus on scikit-learn, which is the most widely used uh, machine learning library in Python. So we are going to start by um, doing modeling in, uh, with a linear support vector machine. So here, what you can see on the screen down here is that we have two types of classes, right? One class is in white and one class is in black. And then uh, the way the SVM works is that it constructs an hyperplane that can separate these two classes. And then it takes the training samples that are very close to the uh, boundary to create support vectors that can create these isolate the cyberplane and separate the data as much as it can, right? So this has a very important advantage because the way this algorithm works is that it lowers the generalization or error of the classifier and it lets us um, generalize better. So this algorithm is widely used in many applications and it's fast, it's linear, and it has been proven to be one of the best in machine learning. So that's the reason why we're gonna focus on that. But I also wanted to show you an ensemble learning algorithm, which in, in this case is, is called extra trees. And this is very fast compared to uh, another ensemble learning algorithm that's called random forest that is also very widely used. Um, if you've never seen any uh, ensemble learning algorithms before, the way it works is that it constructs trees like this, and then we pass the data to the trees, and the trees have to make some decision on the data, right? And then we obtain the predictions out, right? And then by some voting mechanism, we can take what these guys came up with, and then the majority decides what's our final prediction, right? So if we go back to SVM, this is like a single, a single branch without the trees, just goes the data into a single model, and then we get a single um, accuracy score, right? But here in Ensemble Learning, we're taking several trees, and then at the end, we generate some voting function that can take the prediction from each of the trees. So um, going back a little bit with cross-validation, I'm going to use a cross-validate function from scikit-learn. This is very new, so if you were, use scikit, you were using scikit-learn before, I would recommend you to update your uh, library because this is a very new uh, library for cross-validation. And the way it works is that we pass our data, we pass our labels, and then some scoring function that has, in our, in our case, some motion labels and color labels. And then we can split the data into some uh, strategy, for example, two folds, three folds, so depending how many folds we want. And for example, one of the advantages of doing these kind of things is that you can set in this parameter and jobs the number of CPUs you want to use for computation, right? So. It's just as easy as putting minus one in this um, parameter here to, to say that I want to use all the processors of my computer, right? And this is very good because uh, each of the faults, as I said, you need to train a model for each of the faults. So if you train in parallel, for example, you have a five processor computer, right? So you can send the, each fault to one of the processors in your computer. So this is going to accelerate more the way this works. And this is being done automatically, so there is a library called, called uh, joblib, but this is running under the hood, so you don't really know how it's working, but it's sending the, the, the jobs to the processors in your computer. So 
now it's time to do the tutorial. So can you show hands if you're gonna follow the tutorial with me? Okay, great. So um, who is not yet, who has not downloaded the files yet? Okay. Um, There's a link in the email that went out right before this. There's a link to a, a Stellar page that has a link to the GitHub with the data on it. Yeah. So that's one way to get it. Or you could go to the, the link up there. Yeah, so I have this link here. And whoever is not yet um, with us downloading the files, please follow this link. Just bit.ly slash spikes hiften LFP hiften the code. What kind of system is best for running Anaconda? What kind of system would you uh, use? Windows, so Linux, Mac? Well, the Linux. first system that was developed, uh, well, Anaconda is Python, right? So what Anaconda has is they just compile all these packages together and so you don't need to install like all the scientific packages, right? So I think Python was written first in Linux. So I think uh, it will be better optimized in Linux because that was the, the core of the library. And then they start moving to Windows and Mac OS. So if you really want to optimize your code and things like that, I think Linux, Linux is the best, best way to go. So uh, if you follow the link, you should be here in my GitHub webpage. So you can click here on the uh, links here from download LFP data. And then we have also the spike data. So you can use any, any of the two links. I put two because it might, sometimes it doesn't work. So you have two links you can follow for each of the data sets once you are in this web page, so don't, don't type the links. <laughs> Just go to the GitHub web page. And then once you have the files, so for those of you that already have the files, just go to the directory that you download the files to, and then just unzip the files, right? So if I have this file here, I can just click, uh, right click, then on zip, extract here for both of them. So who's, who's using Anaconda for the first time? Okay. So if you're using Anaconda, you can just uh, type Jupyter. Actually, um, yeah, if, you, if you type Jupyter in Windows, you're just gonna open the Jupyter notebook. Right? The, the way um, you can do is uh, Windows is Python um, notebook. If you type well, actually okay let me just type what you have to do so whoever is using anaconda you just have to go to the anaconda prompt right so there should be a link in either, either your desktop or if you type on windows anaconda prompt should, uh, you should click on that so then she open the terminal. She open something like uh, like this, right? When you uh, click on uh, on the prompt, and then once you're in the terminal, just type Jupyter Notebook uh, terminal. And then it should open something like this in your web browser. So 
So is everybody here or is anybody having any problems so far? So if you are in, uh, in Jupyter now, you can just go to the place where you don't load the files, go to that uh, folder, go to the folder uh, in your computer where the files were downloaded. And then we're going to open first the LFP uh, notebook. So once you enter the, let me see if I can make this bigger. Okay. So here I'm inside the LFP decoding folder, right? And I can just click here on this notebook to open it. Once I have on zip, right? So here is the zip file, LFP decoding zip, and I unzip both the LFP and the spikes, and here I have the two folders here. Then I enter, and then I need to click this guy to open the first notebook. Anybody having any problems so far? Oh. Yeah. All right, guys, so if you have never used Jupyter before, um, the way it works is that, so I have already generated the code for you. So what we're going to do, <laughs> I don't know what so what we're going to do now is we're just gonna run what I have written for the tutorial now, right? So one way to do that, let me see if I can, so can everybody see now, right? Yeah. Yeah, so what I'm going to do now is uh, you can click run here to start running the code. So when you click run, you go one by one, one line by one line. And also a shortcut is to click shift enter. So if you click your shift enter, you will just run one of the cells here. So who, whoever wants to follow, we sit here already, everybody? Or is, or do you need any help so far to uh, get here? Oh, oh sorry, it's, it's, it's kind of handy. You, I see you import your random forest classifier, but it's, it doesn't appear in the following code. Was it actually used in your decoding or uh, was it um, Yeah, well, the reason why I'm including this is because uh, if you want to try it, we can try it later on. Okay. If we have time, but we're not gonna use it right now. Okay. The reason why it's important is because maybe sometime, maybe somebody can say like, "Can you run the random forest?" and we can go and do it. So, but it's not part of any of the code now. Uh, anything else so far? All good. Okay, guys. So, let's get first in the LFP uh, notebook. So here we have uh, NumPy which is the scientific computing library of uh, Python, matplotlib, which is the plotting library, OS is for some operating system uh, things that we're going to do, and it's going to become clear what, what's going on. And all these guys are part of scikit-learn, right? So all of this is the machine learning library that we're going to be using today. So we have here uh, the ensemble algorithms are, are here, are stored in this uh, variable and this method, then we're going to use also preprocessing, ensemble, metrics, uh, model selection. Here is the cross-validate function that I showed you before. So this is the way we import it from scikit-learn. And then we also have here the F-score that talk a little bit during uh, the presentation. So yeah, so if we want to import all of this, I just click shift enter and then it has executed this line already, as you can see here. All right, so then we go and define our, our scoring function. So what does this mean? So it means that we have the F-score as a metric that we're going to assign to the labels of zero and the labels of one. The labels of zero are going to be uh, the motion labels and the labels of one are going to be the color labels. And then we're, we're saying here that we are not going to average anything. What this means is that we want the single score of the label zero, right? So we don't want to, the, the model to combine anything. So that's the reason why we're declaring this as null. So um, as I said, we are just going to work with one session of the data set that I show you. So this is the name of the session. And then we import it. 
just as a, this is just the way to specify a string here for those people that is doing MATLAB. Just, um, is it the same in MATLAB or not? Yep. Yeah, yep. okay. So now we go ahead and um, load the files. So as you can see here, um, this is the color file for PFC and before and for LFP, right? So we're going to decode uh, local field potentials and we are here declaring the session and here is the entire name of the file, right? And then we load that into this variable called xcolor. So if you go back here, those are the files that are in the directory. So we have color, motion, and color and motion, right? So those are our data and our labels. And the way we do that in machine learning is we give an x a variable to the, to the data and then a y variable to the, to the labels. Right? So we are just loading our data right here, right? So for example, if I just print uh, here the variable, I can obtain the, sh the shapes of the array. So the way this array is organized is that I have this number of electrodes, this number of trials, then I have this number of features, right? So if we go back to the presentation, I show you uh, here the way the, the time domain is organized, right? So here the limit is 2,500 milliseconds, right? And you might ask how, how, how did we go from 2,500 to 800, right? So this was one of the pre-processing -pre steps I did. So I reduced three times the time domain because the, the data was very large for me to give it to you. It was like 600 megabytes or 700, so it was too large. So I decided just to don't sample the data so you can actually run it on your laptops. So that was one of the pre-processing steps but actually didn't affect much the accuracy or any of the processing that we're going to do later on. So this is the way the, uh, the, arrays are, the arrays are organized. And then we can check if any of the data has any NANDs. So we check here if there are any NAND values here. And we said we can check that there are no NANDs in the data, right? And then we have a look at the labels. So here you can see that uh, we have PFC and B4 labels. Right, so we have 47 of them. And then um, in total for both PFC and B4. So for PFC, we have 36, and for B4, we have 11. So this is the number of electrodes that we have in this file, right? So uh, is everything he here uh, clear so far? So this is the number of electrodes for our data, and then here is the number of labels for our electrodes. Right, and those are separated by PFC and B4. So once I finish uh, loading the color uh, samples, we can just go ahead and load the motion samples, right? So I can load now the motion samples, and then I can print what's going on in inside the array, right? So here I have my motion samples, and I have 47 electrodes at 370 trials, and 800 uh, time features, right? So this is, everything is compressed into like a different axis. So we, I don't have to uh, load one file for each of the data here, right? So I can just express that as a single array. And then um, I can check again if there is any NANDs in the data. So this is the, the way to verify that, you know, you are not trying to model with any NAND values inside. And then I check again the, uh, the labels of the motion uh, data. And I can see here that I have 47 electrode labels then divided by PFC uh, before here, right? And also I have the same number of electrodes for motion because it was captured from the same session at the same time. Okay, so I have now this uh, plot function, right? So. What it does is just takes the, um, the data, the, the data, the labels, uh, the number of electrodes, the number of trials, the rule and the time, and then it's going to generate me some nice plots of the data, right? So 
for example, here is the, uh, we define the time vector here, which is going to be our first axis. And then we can select which electrode I want to, um, I want to plot and the number of trials that I want to plot from those, from that electrode, right? So, and I have the rule for color and the rule for motion, right? So I, ha I pass the color here and I pass the motion here. So let's execute this command. As you can see here is the same data that I showed you, right, before. So here we have 10 trials for color and we have 10 trials for motion. And this is the shape of the arrays, right? So we have the shape for PFC and the shape for uh, B4. And this is the, the way the data looks like, right? So You're I... You're making me dizzy, man. Sorry? You're making me dizzy. <laughs> so if we change here, uh, for example, for electrode 5, and then we, sh we select here the number of trials to be 20, we can replot again. Let me see if it, this is better. So we can see now that the data has changed, right? So this is a different number of electrode and a different number of trials. So for example, I can just put one here. If I change to one, you only see one signal here being plot for motion and for color, right? And this is all being done here with uh, the um, matplotlib library. I just call plot and then I pass the time trials and then I say the color, I assign a label and then I just create some grids, legends and titles, right? So we have accomplished something now, which is just getting some plots of our data. Any questions so far? So as I said, uh, the code is online, so you can just play at home and you can actually use your own data. So if you have something in this way, the array in this way, so for example, we have, uh, you can have the trials, sorry, the trials, the electrodes and the time, you can use this function to plot your own data. All right, so we can keep going now. So here, uh, so we are taking the uh, label array of the electrode for color, and then we are printing the unique values that are inside here, right? So we can have either PFC on B4, which are the two areas of the, of the brain that we're interested to analyze. So, okay, so what I said first is I want to focus on PFC. So I execute PFC first, and then I said that I want to uh, train my classifiers and do my cross-validation in a time window of 50 milliseconds, right? So what I do here is uh, I start uh, sampling from, the, from time in a 50 milliseconds windows, and that's the way I'm gonna pass it to my classifiers. So I take 50 milliseconds of that window and then run the entire algorithm and see if I can decode from that window. Right? That's, that's the plan of the, of the cross-validation and the way we do the, the learning here. And so for cross-validation, I can do five folds. Uh, as I said before, we can change this to 10 or to two to three. So we can try that later on when we are done with the, with the modeling. But for now, let's just try five, which is the default, right? And then I want to assign that I want to use support vector machines. So I can put here a linear as well to say that I'm using a support vector machine that is linear. And then I want to create a folder. So inside this folder, I'm going to save all the data that I'm going to uh, simulate here. And the reason why I'm doing this is because sometimes it's very expensive to run experiments. So the reason why I'm creating this folder and to saving all the results there is because I can just pull it up later on if I want to generate some graphs or anything and I don't need to run this again, right? And this is very useful when you're dealing with like large data sets. You don't want to run like a simulation of three days again and again because you need to change your plot, right? So in this way, uh, we can just save the data somewhere and then pull the data out whenever we need it in the future. So here is where the uh, operating system uh, import that we did is being used. It's actually used to make a folder. So then we execute and then our folder should be ready now. So if you look back to your folders, it should be there. So it's being created, right? So we have now a new folder in that has been created by your program and you can enter and there is nothing inside there right now. 
Uh, so then we define the support vector machine model that we want to use. And for that, we use this function called SVM. So if you want to go back to the beginning, you can see that uh, from scikit-learn, we just import SVM, right? So then, uh, where were we? Here, okay. So then I can define my classifier that way, okay? And then, for example, if I want to see, I can put this uh, interrogation mark here to obtain more information of the classifier, right? So if I do that, then uh, Jupyter is going to tell me, OK, this is the type of uh, the variable that you're analyzing, and this is the format inside it. This is where it is. This is the package that you're pulling out, and there is the description. You know, it says linear support vector machine. This class supports both dense and sparse inputs, and the multi-class support is handled according to a one versus the rest scheme. So you have all this information, right, about the parameters, about anything about that classifier, right? So you can just pull that up by asking here the question mark. So when we, we, when we leave this empty, so we don't declare anything inside here, right? If you see back here, there are some uh, parameters that we can set, but we have left them by default when you just put uh, the parentheses here, right? So, um, so keep going with our modeling. So now here, what I'm doing here is just um, printing what's inside the motion uh, shape, right? So we have neurons, trails, and the time domain, as we have seen before. So now here, something very interesting has happened because we now have selected the current area that we want to analyze, right? So we're interested in PFC. So then uh, here we declare the PFC function and then we extract from the motion samples only the PFC function. And this is the resulting, um, the resulting vector that we obtain from there. So then uh, we roll the axis. So what happens here is that we change this axis to, to here and then this to here. And the reason for that is because uh, we're going to uh, pass this to a machine learning model. So we want this to be the first axis that's going to take the uh, samples in the machine learning model. And then we're going to collapse this to axis at some point because that's the way we pass uh, vectors to a support vector machine has to be samples by features. And we, here we have three, um, three dimensions. So we want to collapse it into. Uh, any questions so far, guys? Um, yeah, well, yeah. you're making an assumption when you collapse those two dimensions um, because, um, you know, you have, you have an autocorrelation function in time yeah. for any neural signal. And that autocorrelation function basically says that yeah. nearby points are related to one another. Uh, and you can actually see, uh, as a function of time, how mm -hmm. related they are. And so nearby points that are next to each other within a trial are going to be strongly autocorrelated. Uh, points that are not neighboring in time, i.e. in different trials, are yeah. going to be um, basically not autocorrelated at all. Mm -hmm. So you're sort of confounding that perhaps by collapsing across those two things. And in fact, correct me if I'm wrong, but does it even matter if those things are in time or out of time, if the features are actually in time or out of time? Does okay, we, we can do it in Word, so what's going on? Suppose that I have a 50 millisecond window, right? That's the window I want to take for modeling, right? So then, um, Suppose that I have uh, four neurons, right? So what I do, uh, so I have four neurons and suppose that I have 100 uh, trials, right? So this is the way, the way my data is being organized. And if we go back to the format that I had before, the first axis are the trials, the second axis are the neurons, and the last axis is the time domain, right? So this is our window, right? So what I do there is I take four neurons, and I multiply their uh, time domain, which is by 50 milliseconds. So the total is 200 milliseconds, right? So these 200 milliseconds are going to be the features of our model, right? So now I have 
in the form 100 by 200, right? So first are the samples, and then here are the features. So again, right? the question is um, that, yeah. the, that there was a, there's a native meaning of nearby points yeah, but, in the feature space. But when you say nearby points, you mean from the same neuron? Or what do you, exactly do you mean? Yes, that? exactly. So different milliseconds that yeah. are from the same neuron mm -hmm. are going to have a particular correlation function to those yes. measurements mm -hmm. that is very different from different um, n neighboring time points from another neuron, right? Yeah. So, um, in other words, um, the question is that you have an autocorrelation, uh, you have a correlation structure in your data, but the way that you're collapsing is not respecting that you know, autocorrelation structure. So then my yeah. question is, yeah. does that matter for the sorts of results that you might get, or does it, Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't even matter. Well, as far as I know, it doesn't matter so for words, the experiments I've done so far. So, in other words, you can yeah. randomize the order of that second dimension of the matrix, and it would come out yeah. exactly the same. What do you mean with randomize? The two hundred. The features. Yeah. Two hundred. Yeah. So right now they're ordered from one to two hundred. Yes. And in that order of one to two hundred. Yeah. Uh, the elements one to fifty have a particular autocorrelation. Mm -hmm. And the elements 51 to 100 have a different autocorrelation structure, and yeah. so on and so forth, in blocks of 50, because 50 is the number of milliseconds. Yeah. Right? So nearby points in the feature space between 1 and 50 are related. Mm -hmm. Nearby points between 51 and 100 are related, and so on and so forth. And so what you're telling me is that that relationship doesn't actually matter for the performance of the algorithm. I could just as easily randomize, take a random input of those, uh, of those, of those orders and get the same classification accuracy. Is that correct? Yes. But as I said, you need to take in consideration the context that we're doing this. So first of all, it's one session, right? So the electrodes, um, sorry, so the neurons here were acquired at the same time, right? So if we, if we go back to the first image, they were filtered by the same wideband uh, signal, right? So I'm not sure if this holds on what you're saying, but if it does, um, if the autocorrelation also has a problem in, in that context, then it, it doesn't matter, no, I think. Th this is not something that's a, a feature of the signal processing. This is something that's a feature of any neural signal. Neural signals mm -hmm. in space and in time are related to one another. Yes. And across space, yeah. 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 you know, yeah. you yeah. design a specific yeah. algorithm that yeah. uses yeah. autocorrelation. Perhaps you can use that yeah. autocorrelation to make sense of these models, but these yeah. don't use that that feature. Okay. So I don't see how you could. I mean, if you, you can do an SVM yeah. and yeah. and gain further insight using the autocorrelation function. No, SVM doesn't care the ordering. Yes, Absolutely at all. Yeah, yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. all. Confident. The yeah. SVM yeah. doesn't care about yeah. what is the structure that you already know. It's saying it can extract whatever structure it sees. So mm -hmm. if you already know what the structure is, then give it the way you want to give it. So it's OK. So you might see differences if you structure it the way you want. Mm -hmm. But as far as SVM is concerned, it's saying, whatever you give me, I'll try to find a structure. That's right. it. Right. Yeah. So that's uh, very particular of the algorithm. So it takes the feature space and it can do any kind of transformation according to the optimization algorithm that we have, right? In our case here is to, mac to find the maximum hyperplane, the, the best hyperplane that can maximize the separation of the two classes, right? But yeah, good question. Uh, anything else, guys, so far? Okay, cool. So uh, here, uh, so we have now processed or, um, or motion labels, right? So now what we need to do is, okay, so I have my motion array and I need to generate some labels of that motion array, right? So what, the way I do that is to use this numpy repeat function. So I said, okay, so motion is going to be my zero label. And then I take the shape zero, which is the trials, and then I give it that many numbers of, um, of repetitions based on this number that I obtained from here. 
So now I can say that my motion label has is this label and then this many according to the to to, to the um, electrodes here. <coughs> right. So now uh, we go to the color processing and we need to do exactly the same thing. So I don't need to go over explain here, but just we just rolling the axis from here. Uh, the trials are going to be first. Then we have here the neurons, and then we have here over time what's what's going on. And then we use the same function. We use the repeat function, saying, okay, so I have the shape zero, which are going to be our samples, are going to be the ones that I want to uh, repeat. Right. Okay. So I think something happened here. It then roll here. I think I might have skipped that to rolling the array or I might have executed that two times <laughs> but let's go back and the trials have to be first so they are not first so I'm rolling this again so for example yeah if I execute this line two times so it's going to roll this and then roll it back again right so I might have done that I don't know but we need the trials at the first uh, dimension and then we generate the labels from that dimension which I'm not sure why it's not okay there it is so here is our first dimension and then we generate the, the labels from that dimension and then we just uh, keep going and then we have our color which is one our motion that is zero right there so here are the shapes for both of them so we have uh, 370 for motion 372 for color those are the trials and then we concatenate the array right so this dimension here gets concatenated here and then since we have the same dimensions in everything else then we can do the concatenation by this axis so this is something very important to consider as well when you use this concatenate function uh, the only different axis that you can have is the one you are concatenating everything else has to be the same uh, for example, one of the problems that we're having right now is that over, over several sessions, you will have different types of structures in the data, right? So, for example, here I have 36 neurons, right? But in another session, I might have 50 neurons. So, what's the best way to concatenate those two things? Because the trials are changing, but the neurons are also changing, right? So, I, I have either to fill out with zeros or I have to throw out some of the data that I have. Right, so, so those are the things you also need to think about. So how, how can I deal with arrays that are not the same length when I'm trying to combine them? Right. So yeah, so this is the way uh, the, the motion and color uh, data looks like. So now that is concatenated, and then I also concatenate the, uh, the labels. So I have motion and color labels that are this length right if, if if we want just to see uh, how the array looks like i can add here a print function and then i can print the contents right so here are motion and color labels right so i have created my own array of data and i have created my own array of labels and then i'm ready to start training my algorithms because i have i have my my motion and color uh, data and labels ready to to be passed to a model right so but that's not the whole story right if we go back to the motion and color um, to this array we still have the 800 uh, millisecond uh, time frame right so that's from the beginning to the end so and i said so i want to take 50 millisecond windows right so what's the best way to do that and one way to do that is to use this function called array, array split. So what happens here is, so it's part of NumPy. So what happens here is that I pass this data here and then I say, okay, by the, um, so let me just print this so you can understand better what's going on here. So uh, I have a time window of 50, right? So we define this earlier. And then this shape, number two, is the time domain, right? So this is the length of the array from zero to 100. 
So then I want to say to, the, to here that I want to generate splits that divide the time by the number of, of windows that I have here, right? So if I pass this here, this way, and then I specify to the, I don't know why I can't select it, but yeah, just pass this to, and then also say by which axis I want the arrays to be split, right? So that's all the information I need to pass to this uh, function in order to generate the windows here. So I pass that into the function, and then we can examine what has been created in this new variable. So the variable is called split area windows, and then we can obtain the, the information inside this variable. So the type of, of variable is, is a list, and is of length 16. Right, so we can print the length here. And as you can see here, look at the element, the elements inside. So it has already split or array evenly by the number of windows that we need. All right, so, so now we have everything ready to start training because I have my labels. All the labels are, are ready and all my windows are ready as well to be put into, uh, into an algorithm. And then I define here uh, my time vector. So here it has to start at our first window. So the first window is 50. So that's where I start because the first prediction is gonna be after the first window, which is the 50 milliseconds. And it's gonna end at 2,500, right? So then I generate uh, evenly spaced numbers between this range. And the number is actually the length of our windows, right? So what I'm doing here is okay, I want these many numbers of evenly spaced numbers to be created between 50 and 2,500, right? So we can see exactly at which point in time some stuff is happening or some events uh, of the decoding. And this is the way the array looks like. So now uh, we are ready to start training our machine learning algorithm. So we uh, generate the list. These lists are going to be uh, where we store actually the depth score and the standard deviation. So we're going to plot the decode over time and we're also going to plot the standard deviation for color and motion. So I'm generating this uh, list in advance to say to the algorithm, I want to say inside the list, the scores that the algorithm is going to return for me. So now uh, I'm going to iterate. So this variable is for each window that's inside the split area window, do all of this, right? And what's happening inside here, here is the, the collapsing uh, line that I was talking about that we had the discussion with Andre. So we, we take the first, the way this works to, to collapse the window is to use the reshape function. So I take the array, which is the window, and then I say, okay, my first, uh, axes are going to stay the same, but my second axis are, has to be reshaped, right? So what I do here is I collapse the first and the second dimension with this function. So now, uh, after I execute that line, I have the data ready to be passed to the algorithms. And as I said, I need an array of the form uh, samples by features. Right, so once I have a, a 2D vector, right, so it has to be 2D. So once I have this array, which is X window here, so we can say that this is equal to X window. So once I have this, then I, I'm ready to cross validate with that array, right? So what I do here is I pass the array, I pass the labels, I pass the scoring function that I defined at the beginning and if you want to look at it, we can just go back up there. And the scoring function is here. Just the score for motion and the score for motion, sorry, for motion and for color. And then we assign the labels zero and one for motion and color, which we already created, right? You saw how we created the labels for the two arrays. And then we go the way down where we were here. Uh, so this is the cross validate function back again here and then I said here okay I want uh, five five folds which we uh, assigned to the CB variable before I don't want to return the the train scores so for us the train scores are useless because they are not like out of sample scores so we don't want them to be returned 
and then we assign the end jobs variable that, the, that I was talking before to assign to all the all the cores in my computer, right? So when when I, when I execute this line, like the program will automatically scan for my the cores of my computer and send the jobs there for each of the folds. One one fold is going to be assigned to one of the processors of my computer, just by uh, assigning that to minus one. So then what I do here is uh, out of here I get a dictionary. And it turns out that the two, uh, so I have a dictionary of values, and the, the last two values of that dictionary are the scoring function that I declared before, which is the f-score for motion and the f-score for color, right? So what I'm doing here is that for the last element and the last, before the last, I want to save those values here in motion f-score and the standard deviation. And the way I do it is I average the values there because it's the result of the faults. So I have the test score of five faults, so it's five values. So I average over them, and they, uh, I also uh, obtain the standard deviation there. And then I save that into this list, right? F-score uh, for the accuracy, sorry, for the, for the value itself, which is the F-score, and then the standard deviation. And then for the motion and for the color, which are my two scoring functions that I defined before. And then what I do here is I just um, transform the list to NumPy arrays because um, in order to do some uh, metric manipulation with the results, I need to pass it back to, um, to NumPy arrays. The reason why I use list is because I wanted to append everything into a single array. So those arrays are dynamic. At each iteration, like there is a new value being input into the list. And then at the end, when the algorithm has finished, I say here, I just, I just want them back. I want this list back to be an umpire array. So as I said before, it's also very important to save all results. So what I'm doing here is just using this save text function of part of NumPy in order to save the results of my simulation, right? So what I'm about to execute is going to be very fast to show to you guys. But sometimes, as I said, can take days for some simulation to run, right? So it's very important also to save the results so you can later on manipulate or see what's going on. So where the folder that we created before is going to be used to save the score function here and the score std for the, uh, for the f-score. And then the arrays for, uh, for the f-score for motion and color will also be returned to keep doing more um, manipulation later on. So OK, so this is going to be into a function. Right. And as an input, I'm going to get the, the splits of the area windows. All the windows are here. The labels, the CV, uh, the faults, the scoring, uh, the, the model itself, like the linear uh, SVM, and then the folder and the area here. All right, so we have the final function now. So I'm going to execute. And now this function is ready to be called somewhere else. Right. So I can reuse this function anywhere else in my code now that I have defined it. So now let's pass or uh, or windows or labels or CV everything else that you see here will be passed. Uh, let's execute this. So now we're going to train our model. So as you can see now, it's training. So let's take a look at the values. So what's happening here is I have uh, inside the function I put I have put um, a print function that iterates so over the, iter the Windows iterations and, and over the validation values, and that's the output that we see here. So for iteration Windows iteration one, we can see the cross validation value from one to four, right? So the first two is the time it takes, so it's always going to return this value. So for our simulation right now, it took 0 0.56, 50, 59 uh, seconds to execute the first fold. And also the second fold was around that time. So this, is, this is the time it took for each of the folds to be executed. And then uh, this is the time it took to test once the model was trained. So as you can see, it's very, very small compared to this number here. And then we have the value for the uh, motion and the value for color as well here. And those are the ones that I'm actually saving into my array. So when you see, when you saw up there the average, I'm averaging over this 
this is coarse. And then I'm, I'm also obtaining the standard deviation over the faults here, right? So if, if later on you want to test like a bigger window or more faults, we can do that as well. But yeah, right now this is the way it does for all the windows, so all the windows are here. So if we go to the last one, you can see here, yeah, so Windows iteration here is number 15, right? So this is the last one because I think it start. Yeah. Yeah, here is the 16 here. All right, so here are the 16 Windows iteration now uh, ready. So as I have defined before, so it returns the values that I wanted as NumPy arrays. So I have the score of motion, I have the score for, uh, for color, and then I have also both the standard deviation for motion and color as, as an output. So I can just print here uh, the results, right? So this is for each of the windows. What was the score on each of the windows here? And the length is 16, which is the number of the windows that we have. Any questions so far? Because now we're going to plot the results so you can see how it looks like. But if you have any questions, uh, let me know. So, okay, so here we have a plot function. So in order for, for you to see something, I'm just gonna go and run it. But basically it takes the, the mean and the standard deviation to plot the, the values that you're gonna see here. So I use plot to just generate the average uh, waveform and then the field, field between function like fills in between the standard deviation of the values by passing the standard deviation here. And I also have to pass the color. So uh, for example, green is here and then green has to be here for both of them. And then uh, magenta here and magenta here for motion and color. Right, and there's more details about the grids, the labels, but uh, let's just execute so you can see how it looks like, right? So now we uh, can finish <laughs> and see our, uh, our plot, right? So this is the way it looks like for our model and for the LFP data. So we have first uh, before the queue right here. Or I can use the pointer here. So before the queue, actually the accuracy is around random, right? So there is no information about motion or color at this point because the monkey is just, remember, it's just fixating at one point. So it doesn't know anything about anything. Right, so then I start showing the Q here, and as you can see here, there's a sharp increase here, and then it starts going down, going down, and then once the stimulus is shown, I can be able to decode more about the, the motion and color information, right? And this is for one of the areas, right? So, for example, one of the research interests that I have is to investigate what these waveforms, how do they behave across areas, or what's the, or it will be like the delays or how much the coding I get. So that's something that you can do with this, this type of analysis. Uh, but yeah, so this is the plot that I get for PFC and, and now I can move on to uh, B4, but since we already generated our function for cross-validate and to generate the plots, uh, it's just calling the functions and putting the area there because it's already uh, the finder, but uh, do you have any questions at this, at this point? So for here you use 50 data samples for each window, is there optimal numbers of it? Like, does that matter if you have less numbers per window? Uh, I think traditionally uh, people in the neuroscience field, they tend to use very small windows. So for example, they use like one millisecond window. And I feel that that's pretty slow and that's very precise, but you can actually decode information with one millisecond. Well, it'll depend right. on your problem, right? So if you're, if you're Michael T, it'll be one millisecond. Uh, if you're people like us doing visual neuroscience, 50 milliseconds is a good time window. So it depends on your problem. And that will change the training time, etc., based on how many windows. There is no fixed number as such. You can try a broad number of uh, different, you can go from 50 to 100 and see if the system is performing any better. Or Actually, better. that's a good question. So for example, something we can do right now is to take a smaller window and see what happens yeah, once we're done. About sometimes if we, the, the window is too narrow, you have maybe 
like screen data points, because I know will that give you an accurate um, like performance at all after training? Sorry, if you have one millisecond, what happens? Um, for example, in your case, you have like 2,500 milliseconds, right? Assuming you have 2,500 data point, so every one millisecond you have one data point. If yeah. you narrow down the window to one millisecond, which means every window I only have one number. So then when you train in data using that one number yeah. window, will that give you lower accuracy? Because you don't have enough data for the window. Uh, well, I think that's a good question, but what happens is that what you're passing to the algorithm is not just one point, right? So you have one point, but then you have all these samples. Right. right? For example, if I had 200 samples, I can take one, two, three, or 500 points, right? For th that are the features, right? So what the algorithm is going to do is just look at the relationship between the samples. Because you, you have 1,000 samples, and then you have 1,000 features, right? So then the, the model will try to exploit that, that feature across all of them, right? So basically it's just determining how, how long it takes to run, running that, right? Uh, not necessarily, because like the example that he gave with four neurons and 50 milliseconds, so that will have like two, essentially 200 features. What you're saying is now four features, right? That's what you're saying now. Yeah, yeah. Well, the system might just perform so badly that you can say that at that level you're not a good, you don't have a good classifier. That's another way to test like the limits of the classifier. At what point do you kind of start seeing the system finding representations that are useful? Uh, so you can do a sweep of like, you know, go from one millisecond all the way to whatever is an optimal. Probably it's like a U curve of some sort and then you can penalize. You can do so many other things, right? The yeah. The overall shape should remain the same though, for, especially for a linear classifier. Yeah, but if it's just one feature. Any one given feature would be on average poorer, yeah. but the shape should be approximately. Yeah, but that's another way to evaluate whether the model is the right model. Right? Sure, so, sure. Uh, if you're getting a U curve or right. something like that, then you know that the linear classifier is not the way to go. You have to do some of the modification. Right. Mm. Yeah, so for example, another uh, way to approach your question is uh, what I'm interested in, right? So for example, here I have a very specific time where the queue is happening, right? So for example, between 500 milliseconds and 600 milliseconds, that's exactly when the queue is shown, right? So that time frame, I think, is very important for me because I want to know what happens in that time window, right? So I want to have some definition there, but as, as we have seen here, once that has passed, I might not be so interested, right, after that because the stimulus has shown. Right. For for example, I think that a good answer for you would be that take it as small as smaller as as far as you can get, because as I said, like the smaller the window is going to be harder to train the models, because you need to increase. If you're decreasing the, the window, you're increasing the models that you're, you have to train, basically. Right. This kind of brings back Andre's point in a way, which is that unlike traditional ways that people do machine learning where they are assuming they don't know anything about the data that they generate. Here we kind of do have some handle, right? Because as you said, 100 milliseconds after the queue or uh, I'm going to see my stimulus come in and we know very well that PFC or V4 that you're going to see is to <laughs> the spike in the data or not showing that there is selectivity and all that stuff. So it kind of matters in a way to say like, we don't care about the first 100 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. We care about the next 100 milliseconds or whatever. And if I don't see a, a rise in the firing rate, all that stuff, then it won't be reflected in terms of selectivity for color or motion or. Yeah. So you yeah, can exactly. kind of use the structure that you already have in the kind of experiment that you've set up, and you know something about these neurons. Uh, but these. Machine learning systems don't care about those things, but you can impose it. It might be easier for you to handle like what you think is the right time window or feature size than just run a sweep from one to 800 or 2,500, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, any other questions, guys? Okay, so uh, I think we have get, been through the basics of what's going on in the code. 
So from now on, we are going to take these blueprints that we have developed. So we have we have a cross-validate function, right? That can take some window and can take um, labels, and then I can generate some scores based on the time window that I had, right? So we're going to reuse those functions from now on to, to decode the rest of the tutorial, right? So it's gonna go very fast now. So now uh, I change the area to before, right? Then I generate a new folder. I want to create a new folder. And let's put here linear as well for five folds and it has a time window of 50. And then I generate my folder and then I basically do exactly the same what I've done before. Like everything that we do before is gonna be exactly the same. The only change in the line is in the area here and I'm gonna show you where that reflects. And it reflects right here. So what we're doing here is based on the uh, electrodes of one area, select the data from those electrodes that are from that area. And then I select that from that uh, data set. And then I do again all these uh, repeat for motion and color, right? And then I have my split area window here. My time, uh, I think I need to change this to 50 again, because that's where our first prediction comes at 50 milliseconds. And uh, so once the processing has been done, so I, I, I can execute that uh, cell here. So everything has been generated again with our um, split area window array right here. And then I can, I can just call the function that I define up there, right? <laughs> that takes my windows, um, the folder, the CV, the area, and then I can run again. But now the big difference is exactly the same blueprint, right? But I have designed it in such a way that I can just change the area label and then I can run the algorithm and then I, got, I, I can obtain my accuracy scores, but now from another area, following the same procedure that I showed you before. Right, so it has finished to iterating over the windows and over the folds. So I have my results here, return here, the score, F score for motion, color, the standard deviation. And they ca I can go and plot now for before, right? So if you want to go back to your folder and look at the, at the folder we created, so for example, one is for PFC, you go inside and you can see this nice plot there because I, I have saved it in the plotting function and if you want to open the scores, you can see here the 16 windows here, right? So here are the scores, so you don't need to run again. You just can pull the data up from these files. The standard deviation here, you, you can just create a new program, say like, okay, I want to plot it again. You can just call these files without the need to run things again. And there you have your image, and then you go back, and then for V4, so we can put them like one to one, right? So the one um, on the left is before and the one on the right is PFC. And this is that, those are the, the quality of the decoding predictions that we can get from either PFC or before using just the raw LFP. And so as I said, so the next step will be spikes, but I have generated this framework in such a way that the functions that we analyze right now would be reused again, but now for the spikes, because I have I can put the 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 array in the same shape as the LFP, and then I can run again all my blueprints that I have generated before. But uh, any questions so far? Okay, so let's just go to spikes very quickly now. So we go to the notebook here, go back spikes, run spikes. Right, so it's the same thing, same libraries here, same scoring function here. The difference is in the data. So now we are calling the spikes here, spike data, spike data and spike labels. Right, so now it's very interesting here, right, because we have now the same uh, three-dimensional vector that we had before, but now the first axes are neurons. They are not that electrodes, right? That's the big difference with the spikes. So. 
we have here each of the elements in the first axis is one single neuron instead of the LFP that we had in the previous uh, notebook. And we have the same number of trials because, as I said, it's from the same session. So we obtain, like, it's a wide bind signal, as I showed at the beginning. And from that wide bind signal, I can extract either the LFP or extract the, the, the spikes by uh, spike sorting. This is based on a continuous measure of the firing rate, right? This is the Gaussian smooth uh, width. Uh, yes, I'm going to show you in a second. Yeah. So here we have the neurons, the trials, the features. We check again if there's any problem with our data. Has any NANDs? No. OK, so then uh, we have our labels here again, PFC, uh, B4. Actually, what happens here, guys, is that I'm going to be honest with you. So PFC here. In the original data set had around like 100 neurons there and i decided to cut it down because it was too big and i couldn't show you the demo here but uh and to make it a little bit more equal right but uh yeah it was more neurons in this case but i reduced it for you guys to be able to follow the tutorial but it doesn't matter because we have we have now the same numbers in both the pfc and before uh so again we now load the motion data. So we have load here the color data and now the motion data right here. And now the, to address Andres' question, so we can see here now the type of the waveforms, right? So we plot the, uh, the spike data here. So it's just like spike rate. And those are the, the figures that I show actually at the, at the beginning of the tutorial. And then, uh, so we can play as, as well with the, uh, with the function. So for example, if I want neuron four, then I want uh, five trial instead of 10, right? So we can see here. Yeah. And here's another example of selectivity. For example, for neuron four, we can see that there is more uh, PFC activity than before. And let's just select another one so you can see. Where one's just one, and one, and then it can put up 20. And as I said, so all this code is going to be available for you guys. So feel free to try with your own data. And if you have any problems, just send me an email and I'll try to see what, how can I help you. But the thing is that I hope this kind of code and this kind of approach can, can really help you to start to think this way to solve your neural decoding problems or anything that that you want to solve. So here we just plot the sample data, but the rest of the things are exactly the same, right? So we have area, and then we, we change the name of the folders to spikes, right? We generate the folder, we generate the linear SVM, we generate the, uh, this is the original shape, and then we when we select only for that area, which is, this is the, the, the key line, right? Because we are just changing here the area, right? For example, the analysis that I'm doing, I'm not only iterating over the two of them, right? So I reuse this code in a very big for loop that can iterate over all the, ses all, all the areas, right? So I have six areas like I've shown before. So I can just change this variable and then dynamically like extract what I want from the, from the array. Then we keep going, we keep going, we keep going, keep going, keep going. We have done this before, split the area, windows. The windows are here. So now here we have the trials here for the split area windows. We have the neurons instead of the, uh, of the uh, LFP. And now we have the same window of 50 milliseconds. Then we keep going. Oh, sorry, here has to be 50. The time vector for our predictions has to start at 50. Then we run the prediction again, the iteration over the classification function, right? So this is the cross-validate function that we examined before. And then here the results are being generated. This is still executing here. As I said, take some time. But now our results are ready. Uh, I can print here the results. And now we can generate our beautiful plot, but now for the spikes, right? So we follow the same approach. So just to summarize what I have did. So I have did the same as the LFP, but now I have switched the axis 
of the elef of the uh, electrode axis have been switched now to the neuron axis. Right. That's everything that has changed from here now. Obviously, I had to do some preprocessing before, right? So I, I didn't like spikes are more complicated than the LFPs because you need to calculate the spike rates per trial, right? So just imagine running a function for each of the trials of all your sessions. It's going to take some time, right? So it takes more time for preprocessing, but you know here you can see the decoding accuracy. Now we go into the other area. And there we go, guys. So that's for B4. And then if we go back to our folders, it should be now uh, the spikes decoding inside here. Should be the result right there. So we just open the folders. Here's PFC. Here's B4. Right, guys. So here is PFC and before now, but with the spike rate. Right, so if you want to make like uh, to compare the LFP and the spikes, we can do that. We can just open the image for the PFC. You can see here, right? So on the right is the LFP, and on the left is the spike rate. So that's the type of decoding that we get out of the signals that we just input into our models and that we have created in real time. Any questions so far, guys? Yeah. So you use a specific decoding algorithm, right? What happens if you make a different choice of, of decoder, decoding algorithm from scikit-learn, let's say? Uh, probably you're going to get a different type of prediction of the encoding, right? Depending, I think that the main differences are when we're changing the approach of the algorithm, for example, if I stay with the family of ensemble algorithms, I'll probably get a similar shape of the coding, just a different level of accuracy. And if I stay on the linear classifiers, like the same kind of uh, way, but different accuracy levels as well. So I, I think uh, the more important thing here, I think, is the family of the algorithms where we're taking that out from. Yeah. Yes? Uh, just a general question. So you made a point that Python, uh, you, rec you recommend Python, but um, is there any reason to not use MATLAB for these types of analyses? Like everything we did today can also be implemented using different packages. Uh, like well, Python. that's a good question. So, uh, for example, in scikit-learn, um, I can just change the model here, right? So, for example, Everything you can see on scikit-learn, I can just input here. For example, I can change the linear SVM here. I can, I can comment this out, right? And then I can run with the extra trees classifier, mm -hmm. right? So those two, those two things are two completely different algorithms, right? Because one is ensemble and one is linear, right? So there are two completely different things. But the way this uh, library is organized is that you can call this exactly the same methods to the two algorithms. So you can use like plug and play in like different parts of your algorithms, right? So for example, here I can just pass this and then the cross-validation function is gonna look for a fit uh, method that's gonna fit the data and that is gonna see exist in both of them, right? I don't know if anybody here with MATLAB experience knows if that exists in MATLAB, but I personally don't know. Especially yeah. with the neural net stuff, they're getting there. <laughs> they made it pretty simple. Yeah. Well, um, uh, so for example, another problem that I have with MATLAB personally is that these data sets, for example, we play with a very small data set right now, right? But the sessions that this neural data has are like very large. I have one that is almost like 17 gigabytes, right? And in, in Python, that session takes me to load, I don't know, suppose that takes me five minutes. If it takes me five minutes in Python, it would take me like 20 minutes in MATLAB just to load the file, right? Like, because that's actually what I do because my lab has all the files on MATLAB. So I have to load first the MATLAB file in MATLAB to extract some 
I don't know, information or anything, and then I have to put it in, in Python, right? So that's, for me, that's the first problem I have with MATLAB myself, right? The, the loading times for the files are, are huge compared to the way Python is. Maybe another question, just practically about uh, how to, uh, how you how you have thought about putting sessions together, right? So you just mentioned that you have lots and lots of sessions. So would you get separate model fits for every session and then average across sessions, or would you take all of the data? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So for me, the best way to go is to take all the sessions together into a single model. Into a single model. Right. How would yeah. you do that? We're working on it. <laughs> but yeah, so the problem is, as I said, the, the two main problems with that approach, one is the difference in the lengths of the arrays, right? Yeah. As I said, if I want to concatenate two sessions, it's not, it's not an, as easy as just calling two axes to be concatenated because they are different lengths because of different neurons, different trials, right? Yeah. So I need to find a way to, to just either cut or fill with zeros, or some some way, I don't know. And what then, about, uh, re resampling, right? So yeah, some yeah, some technique to resampling. I don't know. Don't I have to think about it, it, right? Just use it in the yeah. Ways, right? So suppose that I'm done with that problem, right? The second problem is RAM, right? Mm -hmm. Because now I have to fit all the sessions uh, uh, into a, like a single model in real time, right? Yeah. So that, for example, all computers have 128 the limit. I mean, I don't know if we have access to a cluster that has bigger program that, like that, but that's my personal but limit, a right? Lot, a lot of these steps are independent, right? If you're running uh, cross-validation, each, each fold is independent, so you can read that from memory. Each time is independent. Yeah. You don't need all the time yeah, yeah. all yeah, the so, times so, in memory, right? Yeah, for example, if you just consider one fold, right? Yeah. In one fold, I have to uh, fit one-fifth of the data, something like that, right? Yeah, but also there's also the time dimension you can cut that into one twentieth and one fifth, and now you have one one hundred of the data in independent uh, samples, yeah. right? Yeah. Any comments, Harry, about this? Two orders of magnitude reduction is not too bad, right? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any recommendations on how to optimize the? Uh... I also want to speak on the behalf of the deep learning community here. <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, what we typically do if we do want to train a neural network with a lot of data is that we don't actually load the, all the data onto memory un unless we're actually using it. Because uh, we train it in, in a batch by batch fashion, right? We only need the batch to be in the memory when we need them to be. So we, don't, we just load the data on the fly instead of uh, loading all the data into memory. But it's true that we don't need to uh, uh, all the uh, samples from those 2.5 seconds, we just need a uh, hundred of those. But that's going to depend on, um, like for example, if, if you have some other um, set of experiments that require you to load like one second out of this 2.5 second, then you're in trouble. So yeah, it's how we depend on. Like, yeah, so, yeah, so as, as Andrew and Harry has said here today, uh, there should be a smart way to load parts of the data in memory and then, as I said, save your results and then combine everything together. So that's another approach to do that. So just to wrap up, guys, um, so this code is online. You can play with it. You can change the time windows. You can change the classifier. You can play with a lot of things here. So I, can, I have made it in such a way that you can just change parameters and see what happens. For example, when we played here with the neurons plotting here, you can just change the neurons here and the trials here, and you can see here the change. So almost all the code is like that. So you can actually put your data, try to put it in the same format as here, and then try to get your decoding done. Um, yeah. So unfortunately, we didn't have to go, we didn't test anything else. But yeah, I encourage you to try that. Uh, for uh, those people that are doing MATLAB, there is something called the MATLAB decoding toolbox. So please go and check that out because that has been developed by Ethan Mayer. So if you go to that link there for the CBMM tutorial, there is more information about decoding and he has explained also um, his research. He's doing a lot of research on decoding. So check his papers, check that those videos there. And uh, yeah, so if you want to check MATLAB, just go to those links. 
And also, so if you felt that the scikit-learn part here was too heavy for you, the guy that invented scikit-learn, well, one of the initial developers, he just releases uh, at a higher level uh, library, so easier to, to deal with. It's called the Data Analysis Baseline Library. So if you want to check that out, also, also go ahead if you felt that scikit-learn was too hard or anything. But for me, I think scikit-learn is, is easy enough. But uh, anyway, guys, thanks so much for coming. Uh, we have five minutes for questions if you, ha if you have any, but thank you. So I do have a question related yeah. to model, uh, choosing the right model, right? So yeah. uh, usually you end up with uh, perhaps more neuron than you really want to, although I don't understand what it means. But So you, you have a lot of neurons, and you're trying to figure out, do I need all of them? Or how can I pick and choose which ones I want to use? Um, or say I come with like a more complicated model than I actually need to fit the data, how do I in a systematic manner, understand how good the fit is and compare it to how good, how many parameters went into the fit. Do, do you get what I'm saying? Like something like, uh, mm -hmm. well, if you have like the 30 parameter model versus like a five parameter model, even though my parameter model is doing 5% worse than mm -hmm. 30 parameter model, you could perhaps make a case that five parameter model is better. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, is there a systematic way to analyze that using scikit-learn, like something like the information criteria that people use, the IKK or the base? Is there like a systematic way of doing that here? You, you mean to check uh, how the parameters affect the model and how that uh, affects accuracy of uh, the the ability to to the code? Yes. So, I mean, you can imagine like adding more parameters. Yeah. In your model is going to make your model potentially better yeah. as long as you have enough data, right? Yeah. So how do you systematically uh, evaluate how good the model is, given the number of parameters you put into the model? Well, that's, I think that's a good question, but uh, just going a step back of what you said, for example, let's suppose that I just evaluate the accuracy, right? Let's okay. stay with accuracy. Okay. So some of the problems I've had in my research uh -huh. is that for example, the, the graph that I show when the monkey is fixating, right? Like, you, you should not be able to decode anything there, right? Because the, yes. right, it's the fixation period, right? Yes. And some of the models I've run, like, the accuracy goes like 80% there, right? And I'm like, okay, so I'm able to decode here, why? Right, so that's a clear example that the model is like overfeeding and not really like understanding your data, right? So that's, that would be uh, an example of how you can debug these kind of questions, right? Like, so I have this very fancy model that can take all this data, it has all these parameters, but then once you test it in a part of your experiment that you, sh you are sure it shouldn't decode anything at all and it's able to decode some stuff, and I think that that's where, well, that's where you can say. Well, that's for other reasons, right? That means uh, maybe the animal is able to predict what the kind of trial is even before the trial even started, and that's, that's concerning for other reasons. But uh, I, I mean, if you average enough, as long as there's no information in the brain, no matter what you do, you shouldn't be able to get it out on the other side. Do you agree? Like, yeah, yeah, right? I think, so yeah. In theory, like in theory, as long as you're, you're, you're randomizing the trial properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. suppose that you, the pipeline is correct, right? Right, assuming all of that, you should not be able to extract information from Yeah, that. exactly. But I'm going like a, a step beyond that, right? It's like, once you have like, oh, I have a, like a family of models, mm -hmm. right? So which model should I, should be the canonical, quote unquote, best model? Mm -hmm. uh, you can be a simple linear regression model that yeah. has fewer parameters than, say, a, a tree classifier. So how do you choose that? Yeah, it, it depends what you want to get out of it, right? Mm. For example, if you want to explain something about the model, mm. then you should stick to linear models. If explanation about the model doesn't matter, okay. then you can do all these deep neural nets and all these things, right? Okay. Yeah. So for example, I went to my supervisor and I told him, okay, I have this model and this is working. And he told me, so can you explain me the model? Can you explain me what's going on? So I could not because you know it was like a deep neural net. So how can I make any inferences about that? Or yeah. you can track with some attention systems, but you know like that's more complicated. But um, yeah, if you if what it matters for you is interpretability, you should always stick to linear models. 
And then if you, if you want if the information you want to decode is what is of most importance, then you can start looking at other, other kinds of families. But like the rule of thumb is always start small and start very simple. And then if you cannot solve well with that, then start looking at other models or other things that you can solve your, mo your, your problem with. All right, guys. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>